this video, I'm going to be telling you about who I am, where I come from. When I logged into this realm, it was 1982 from what I'm told. 1982, April 29th. My mom was in her 30s. It was the crack era in Harlem, New York City. I was a crack baby. I was born a crack baby. My dad was 70 something years old. And he was a merchant seaman like Dr. Sebi. He looked like Dr. Sebi. I don't know if you've ever seen a picture of my dad. He, kinda, he looked just like Dr. Sebi. They could be cousins or brothers. And um, there I was, I was born. I, was arri I arrived to this, to this realm and they died. The first year they died. They, they transitioned. My mother and father actually kind of dropped me off here. In a sense, I like to look at it like that. They dropped me off. And um, in her 30s, she died of an overdose on drugs, I was told. And my father died in his sleep for heart conditions. And um, they passed away. And then I, when my mother and father passed away, none of my other family members took me because of the fact that I guess they was out partying and it was a time where people were doing whatever they were doing. So I was taken at a young, very, almost damn near infant age and put into foster care. Where I was taken from home to home, home to home. I was taken from home to home as a child. And never, and when I look at my childhood, I never, I don't remember being in one family too much. It's all a blur. A couple people I remember, but I just remember being, I just remember being in different homes all growing up, just different homes, and no one never looking like me. And just being in somebody else's home. I never had like a biological family, and my later on I went to search for my biological family, and I'll tell you about that later and what I found. Um no one no one took me in, no one no one took us in, and uh so we went from foster home to foster home. Now, at the age of, I would say, around 11, 12, um, I was adopted. I was living in the Bronx, raised in New York, raised in the Bronx. About 11, 12, I was, I was adopted in New Jersey, Willingboro, New Jersey. I was adopted there. When I went there, it was adopted by the bishops who... Um, who were, they were abusive. The bishops were abusive. They was in Willingboro, New Jersey. They was very, uh, these people were very abusive. We didn't know that because when we went to visit, it was so nice because it was like grass and we went to visit on the weekend at first. We were foster kids in the Bronx by this lady named Miss Dukes. And, you know, I lived on 300 Morris Ave in, in the Bronx. And um, I was raising that project building like right there for a long time with this lady. You know, we was, um, this is during the hip hop era. I'm growing up through hip hop. You know what I'm saying? And it was different. There was no internet. TV went off. We had Nintendo. We had Game Boys. It was different back then. It was a whole nother world I was coming up in. And um Anyway, fast forward and I um Well let me tell you about one of the experiences I had when I was split up by my brother when I was about six years old. Um, in Queens, I could remember a guy named Mr. Pope. I remember forget Mr. Pope, but I was always a when I say I was a horny child, like I was humping on things, and I was I had sexual urges very young, very young in age. I've had sexual urges. I was humping on like anything I could find. Like I was looking. I remember looking at The Simpsons and getting horny over The Simpsons. Like I was horny over Marge and shit, and I was looking at Lisa and shit like that. And um, I would hump on things, whether it was a, whether it was another kid. It wasn't. It didn't matter if it was a boy or a girl, and I was staying in this family. This is when my sexual sexuality started to kick in, because I was staying in Queens. Me and my brother got separated because we was like fighting each other all the time. And when I was a little kid, you know, it was very confusing for me growing up, you know, not understanding things, because I just logged in. I was just responding to what I was feeling and things going on. So as a child, uneducated about my sexuality, I pray. I pretty much. You know, was humping on the, the other kids in the foster home, you know, just to get my rocks off or just to feel something, you know what I'm saying? And um, he caught me one day, Mr. Pope, the, the dude I had got separated from my foster father, he caught me 
And basically the dude just made me do sexual acts with another boy that I was already humping on anyway. And so he made me uh, put my penis put my penis in his mouth, take a picture. He took a picture, he said, put, put the boy's penis in my mouth, said, took a picture. He said, uh, if you do anything, if you say anything about this, I'm pretty much going to um, tell tell the social worker. And I, I don't know, as a kid, I thought, I thought something was bad, I did. And so I was like, I was really scared. I didn't know. That's why I was really afraid. But so one day, you know, we went to the to the foster agency, Harlem Down, and it's the name of the foster company that I used to be a part of growing up. Harlem Down and on 125th um, in St. Nick. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, um, we went to, I'll never let, forget the lady. Her name was Miss Boss. i never forget the lady, Miss Boss. And Miss Boss, I went to her and I told her, listen, I'm scared. I don't want to go back with this guy. I don't want to go back with him because he did something to me and I don't want to go back to him. I want to go with my brother. And the lady, I got along with the lady and she was like, okay. And then I, then the lady, next thing you know, she brings me to office with the guy. You know what I'm saying? With Mr. Pope. And I'm like, oh shit. She's like, you got to say this in front of him. And I'll never forget my universe doing that to me. Because I was really scared. Maybe I was like six, seven years old. I'll never forget. And I went inside to this lady and I was like, damn. And I told him, I, I stuck up for myself at such a young age. I was so proud of myself. And she took me out of this man's house immediately. And they put me back with my brother in the Bronx, on Morris Ave. I was so happy to be back with my little brother. It was fun. Da, 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 da. Then me and him, late, shortly after God, we got adopted by some play people named Ms. the Bishops. You know what I'm saying? The Bishops would adopt us and would adopt us for the wrong reasons. So we got there. We thought it was all good. They was really nice to us. They took us to the farm. They, it was like, you know, Jersey. It was Jersey, baby. It was South Jersey from New York, South Jersey. It was like a beautiful was nature out there. We was we had bikes. We was, we was loving it. Like, we was loving it. We, we didn't want to go back to New York. We went there for the weekend. And then we came, me and my bro, we came, we came um, back to New York on the weekdays to go to school, but we drove every weekend to go there to, to just test out how the transition would be. And we told them, well, we want to go back. They was treating us so nice. It was so beautiful there. We had a, um, a pear tree and an apple tree in our, in our backyard. We was the only one on the block with a pear tree, apple tree. She had a garden. She told us how to garden and all that. It was beautiful, right? So, then, you know what I'm saying? We uh, we got adopted. As soon as we got adopted, the shit changes. Like they start treating us like different. Miss Bishop starts treating us like real fucking mean. The Bishop lady, she starts treating us real mean. So Miss Bishop was a cancer, and she was diabetic. And every time her, her sugar got low, she would go into these episodes of throwing our clothes out the, throwing our clothes, just waking us up in the middle of the night, snapping like this lady was crazy, yo. But the funny thing is, like you know what I'm saying, like everything happened for a reason. I'm a, I'm gonna go back into that later. You feel what I'm saying? So. She used to like basically abuse us. Like. Basically this is what the lady did. I found this out later. Like. She adopted us. She used to hold her home open for like. Uh, patients. OC, OC, OCD patients. Like. It was basically adults that had like. They were a little slow. They had mental issues. And she would get paid to take care of these people. You know what I'm saying? And uh, these people were slow in their house. So her house was like a, a place where, you know, she had us as foster kids or, or adopted kids. And she had, you know, these clients. She called the clients. They were like people that were grown, but they were kind of slow. And they got SSI checks and she got paid to take care of them. This is how they made their living. They take care of these people. You know what I'm saying? These are adults. They were OCD clients or something like that. Occupational something client or some shit. Um, but what they did with me and my brother Leo... Is basically, they took us out of regular school. They put us on medic. They put us in special school. They put us on medication. We started taking a short bus to school because they they took us out of regular school. We wasn't bad kids. She just did that on purpose. She said we was emotionally disturbed. She put us on Ritalin so that she can get paid for us too. So it was a hustle for her. You know, getting kids was a hustle for her. You feel me? She didn't she didn't adopt us for any good reasons. She adopted. For, this is this is what the universe would be through. You feel what I'm saying? Like this is this is the luck I have. So my mom and dad died. None of my family comes. So I never had no connection to a family. And then the family that I did get adopted by, 
they adopted me for financial reasons as a hustle. So they took us out of regular school so they can get an SSI check. They put us on medication, Ritalin, so they can get an SSI check for us. And they was getting paid like wild money to take care of us. So they made us special, you know what I'm saying? Special ed children. And so, you know, this puts me involved in around kids that was just rebellion and I was like, fuck it, I was, I was doing what they was doing. And you know what I'm saying? And I just started being bad, like just being bad. Like, you know what I mean? I was always good at basketball. Really good at basketball. I wanted to be a basketball player. So this Miss Bishop used to do wild shit to us. She used to like make us like sleep in a room with no lights. You feel me? She made us like there was no light in our room. You know what I mean? Like it was no TV, nothing, just darkness. And we had to use the light from the the the, the, the hallway to shine in and do what we needed to do in the room if it was nighttime. And she would she would always put like she would always tell me that because I was dark skinned that I was um that I was dirty like like she was like you you're dirty like she used to put like Ajax all over me in the tub and make me scrub my skin she's like so for a minute I thought I was a demon because she said my name meant legion she said you're a demon she used to tell me this is what Maisha was talking about when she said that I thought that I was a demon I told her that when I was a child because Miss Bishop told me I was a demon that my not name mean legion like it means a demon so I was I was scared of my own self and my own reflection in the mirror because she told me I was a demon as a child and she used to make me like wash my skin off and, she, and I was thinking that my skin was dirt in my head psychologically she told me this she like my you're dark skin because you're dirty and so I thought it was normal to wash my skin with Ajax, but it wasn't going nowhere. So in my mind growing up, I thought something was wrong with me. I thought this lady was telling me that, you know, I'm a demon. And so I thought something was wrong with me. You see what I'm saying? Until later I understood like what the fuck was going on. But the lady told me like, yo, she used to like put eight, I mean rudely too, just throw it on my face, like put it all over my body. And she would like put this much water in the tub and make me wash in that water and scrub me with like a, you know what I'm saying? Sometimes she would use all kinds. She was just really abusive. She would like hit me. Wash, uh, this lady was like doing wild, crazy shit. One time she always make us like clean up and stupid shit like that and do dumb shit. And like we had to eat at a separate table. Like just, you know what I mean? They didn't let us touch the kitchen. It was like, yo, we, you know what I'm saying? Like they made us come take our pills. We came and take our pills with our water and our food. We took our medicine with our food and shit. Like, she made us sit on the other side. We had to stay in the backyard. And every now and then, as far as we can go was to the park. You know what I'm saying? The park was up the block and it had a basketball court. So that's all I could do was play basketball all day. So I got really good at that shit. So I, you know, just, that was it. And we had to be, we had to be back to the crib. Took us to school. When I was going to school, it was funny for me because all the kids had parents and I was looking at them and putting shit together like, yo, these people's parents really love them. You know what I'm saying? Like, you could tell. You know what I'm saying? Like, because of how kids were at school, they was different than us. And my and my world was confusing growing up because it was like, wait, you're dark-skinned. You must be dirty, too. And I started putting shit together. I used to think, like, dark-skinned people were dirty. You know what I'm saying? And it was fucking crazy, my nigga. Like, I had to wake up. Like, it, it, was, it was on some other shit. This lady, you know what I'm saying? So... Basically, you know what I'm saying? She used to beat me for no reason, just just because her, her sugar was low. She is a diabetic, she used to beat us for no reason. Like, threw my brother down the steps one time, and if she think, if we was in a room sleeping, and she thought somebody was um talking, she would, like, hear stuff. And she'd come in there, we was dead ass asleep, and she'd be like, get your ass up. And she'd start tearing out, tearing out the drawers, and we like, yo, he wasn't talking. Like, you know, one time, like, she bust me in the head, I still got this scar on my head, she bust me in the head with a buckle and my shit started bleeding. This lady was wild crazy where her sugar got low. She just went through these episodes. It was Pentecostal, we had a, it was Pentecostal church, she had beat the Bible into us. Like basically, like she had beat it into us, like, you know what I mean, made us pray, like forced us to get on our knees and pray and like, it was crazy, we had to paint the church, it was, it was crazy, like growing up was wild crazy, you know what I'm saying, like. Miss Bishop was a quite crazy lady. Um, you know, my father's last name was Prada. My name was Eligio Prada. And then I got adopted and become Eligio Bishop. And 
when I got adopted, the bishops had took us out of regular school and put us in. They took us out of the regular school system and put us in alternative school. Put us on Ritalin so that they can get a check for us. Me and my little bro, that's all I ever knew. You talking I used to play basketball. I thought I was a good basketball player. <laughs> Hitting them shots. One day, I was supposed to be home around this time. Before the lights went down. It was right up the block. But I got picked by the older guys. They needed an extra. They didn't have another. They needed an extra guy. I was there. I was on the side. I used to stay looking at the older guys wanting to play with them. And they, they picked me, man. But my little brother went home before me. Like, around this time. But I got home before it got dark. But just because he went before me, it got me in trouble. So, um, but everything happened for divine reason. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Killing them in the game. <laughs> Did my thing. Rushed home. Couldn't even get the praise. It was like, yo, yo, you killed that. Like, uh, I got on my bike. Got back. <sighs> when I got in, she was picking these greens i never forget she was picking these greens and um i came in the house and she was like oh you could just come in here when you want huh i was like nah it's not dark so i got here on time leo left me before he left before but it's it, nah come in this lady got an extension cord Wrapped it around her hand. Right there. And she said, hold out your hands. And I was like, fuck. So she started whipping me. I was like, my whole hand went numb. It was crazy. And she started telling me about, da, 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 you know. And she like, put them out again. And she just kept hitting me. Now, I know it ain't but so much pain someone can take until they either pass out or they snap out. This lady had no remorse. It was like, all right, you hit a child with a stinging cord across their hand four times, as hard as you can, across their arms, as hard as you can. And then you tell them, put your hand back out. And it's like, yo, this is beyond like, you crazy, like, lady, I can't take another hit. If you hit me anymore, I'm go I, I might, I don't even know if I could get another hit. Like, this is crazy. This lady took me to a threshold within myself I never knew of. That day she activated and showed me who I was. Because when she hit me again, before I could put my hand out, I knew I couldn't take another hit. I knew it. I just knew it. I remember in my mind, like, I can't take another hit. This is this hurt way too bad. I can't even feel my hand and my, my arms was tingling. I couldn't feel anything. Like, And she was not stopping. She was going to keep going. Put my hand out again. When she hit me this time, she must have act. It must have hit my hand and activated my, my my DNA or some shit, because I snap. When I say I snap, ah, I, I turned into this this animal, man. This <laughs> I tore this lady house up. I mean, she had been beating my ass for years, but I tore this lady house up, man. It, I remember. I, I I lost it. I lost it. I lost it. I tore her whole house up. And I ran out the door and I slammed the door, right? And I remember my little brother and Mr. Bishop, who never hit us, but he let her hit us and beat the shit out of us. But he looked at me like I slammed the door. I jumped over the fence. I'm like 12, 13 years old, maybe. And I'm running down the block. And man, this this is I used to be scared of this lady. Like, 
completely scared. I snapped, bro. And it turned me into something. I've never been the same. I've been running. I was running. I was running. Running. And in that moment of running, I felt so free. Ah, I didn't know where I was going. But I was, it was cold outside, nigga. I was running back toward the park. <laughs> nigga, I was cold, but I was free. And I was never coming back. Bitch, I was going to run into the woods and you never was going to find me again. Never going to hit me. No one's going to never hurt me again. No one's never going to hurt me again. For me growing up. And um, so after I ran away, I just I just ran, yo. I ain't have nowhere to go. It was cold out there. I was in Jersey. Like, it was wild. Like, I started hanging in the streets, smoking cigarettes, um, just smoking weed, just doing all kind of mischief, hanging with the wrong kids and... I kept running away, and the police kept finding me, bringing me back. I kept telling the police they abusing me, they beating me. Like Dyfus came in, it's called Dyfus. Jersey call it Dyfus, you know, D-Y-F-S. Dyfus came in. I kept telling them they would turn Leo against me, and Leo would say, "Nah, he lying." And it was crazy. I was like, crazy. Leo used to betray me. Like, yo, one time I was about to plan to run away, right? Cause I was like always trying to get out of there. And um, one time Leo was like, yo. He snitched on me. I was like, yo, Leo, we should run away. Like, we should get out of here. We should, you know what I mean, run away. You know what I'm saying? I had planned my escape. I got my bag, put it outside the window, everything, because we slept on the second floor. And so I was going to use the sheets to climb down in the middle of the night. And this nigga snitched on me, man. <laughs> just for brownie points. Just for brownie points, Leo snitched on me. And, um... Just for brownie points, just to, just for attention, he snitched on me. It's funny because it's relevant to what's going on right now. And um, he snitched on me and they, they, they tried to beat me, but I ran away anyway. Because they, at this point, anything that she did to me, she, she knew if she touched me, I was going to rock out. But prior to that, it was a time where she beat me so bad. I had lumps all over my face, all over my... i never forget this moment. This lady beat me so bad, I had lumps all over my head and everything, right? Just because her daughter, her daughter, I cleaned the daughter garage out. And her daughter was like, you know what I mean? She wasn't going to pay me no money for it. And she said she was. And I was upset about that. So I had stormed out her door. And then when I got home, she had heard about that. And she's a cancer. So she take her family seriously. And so she beat me down. Like, she put me in the bathroom and locked me in the bathroom and beat me with a click. I never forgot that moment. That was, like, the worst ever. Because this woman really beat me from a, from a place that was crazy. And the thing is about when I came back to her as an adult. And I told her everything she did to me, she didn't, she didn't, she said she didn't remember none of it. I was like, wow. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So this what this what happened to me. Do I victimize myself for that? Absolutely not. Not at this point in my life. I've already come into my higher self. So I'm just telling you my, my, my upbringing so you can understand. So, you know what I'm saying? This gave me a, a temper. Once I stuck up to her, nobody could tell me nothing. Like, once I stuck up to this lady, no one can tell me shit at all. Like, nothing. At all. No one could tell me anything at all. So fuck it. I'm wilding now. Like the police can't tell me nothing. We was wilding on the police. I was like fighting police. I was wild. Like I was at this point she broke something in me and it just like I was rebellious to any kind of authority. I was like fuck that. I was rebellious against authority. Any kind of authority was resemblance of her. And so I just went all out and said fuck it. I don't give a fuck about none of this shit. And so the, the police kept pulling me back. And then one day the police was like, kept bringing me back. They was like, ma'am, won't you put him in a, in a shelter for boys? And she was like, you know what? Because she was getting a check from me, she was still getting a check. She put me in a shelter. When she put me in a shelter for boys, I had my first experience on like, uh, uh, I had somebody laced my blunt. She was crazy. I had laced it with angel dust. She was crazy, right? I was in a boy's shelter. And it was crazy. It was in Mount Holly, New Jersey. Mount Holly, New Jersey, right? And um, I was out there in that boy's shelter. And I remember smoking smoking with this nigga named Bishop. It's crazy, right? This nigga named Bishop. He was a he was a um he was just a dude known in, in Mount Holly for, for, for wilding out. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and he was just known to be in the streets to be a bad dude. And he used to come through, chill with us. It, it, Mount Holly was bad back then. It was a crazy place. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, like, I was out there, and I was young. This nigga like, yo, you want to smoke a blunt with me, yo, in the back? I'm like, yeah, like, let's go. Like, fuck it. Yo, this shit put the brakes on me, my nigga. 
this shit fucked me up. This shit fucked me up because, you know what I'm saying? I smoked, I was smoking, <laughs> I was smoking the weed, and then we was smoking the blunt. We standing, we standing face to, I had never smoked this much weed in my life. So I'm smoking a blunt with him, smoking it. Like we smoking a whole blunt face to face, like smoking a blunt. And then this shit got weird. Like shit, shit start like trailing, like. And then all of a sudden, I just heard my heartbeat, like. And then I seen him standing there. He was like, yo, son, I'm high as shit. I'm like, yo. And then I threw the I threw the roach down way too early, like, cause it was just like no, like sending my body like throw that shit away. <laughs> cause I had took the last hit and I just threw that shit like down on the ground. That bitch hit the ground and said, you know how you hit when it hit the ground, it said doom doom doom. I was like, the fuck? Yo, I went down and I heard my footsteps like doom doom. I was like, what the fuck? I was like, I heard my heart beat like doom 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 doom. I was like, oh shit, I start wilding. So I grabbed the I grabbed the piece of blunt. And I looked, there was powder in it. I was like, yo, what the fuck is this, son? That nigga's like, yo, chill, son, you high, my nigga. Like, this shit is angel dust, yo. I'm like, yo, you said it's supposed to be weed, yo. I, I panicked out of nowhere, and I hit this nigga, and I broke his jaw. Like, bow! Like, I, you know, later on, like, yo, you broke Bishop jaw, nigga. The nigga looking for you. I'm like, yo, I didn't know what I was doing. I wild, I was running down this alley. It was dark. I was like, yo, somebody help me, yo. I started going crazy, like, it was crazy. I started seeing shit, like, it was wild crazy. My heart was beating fast, and then I was trying to calm down on this shit. I was like, yo, shit crazy, yo. I was trying to smoke weed, like. So I was in the living room inside the shelter, and I'm sitting there, and I'm trying to calm down so bad. I'm trying to relax. I'm trying to, like, all right, just be cool, my nigga. Just, just relax. It's just your heartbeat. <laughs> you know what I mean? This shit is Dooming like doom, 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 doom. I'm like, oh shit, yo, I'm here in my heart. And I could feel it like vibrating my whole body. Like later on, I realized that was my heart chakra. But then I start tripping every time I like went, like, try to like, it's like, like something like whispers in my ear and shells, like, the fuck. And I would snap out of it. And then I would go back into it and I snap out of it. And it was crazy. I was like, I pushed the, 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 it was like staff that worked at the um at the uh at the at the boys' shelter. I pushed the nigga out the way. Nigga, I was like, I start hearing stuff like if you wanna get that we used to talk about like stuff that make you come down off the high. We was always talking about that, like, yo, drink milk. I was like, I pushed the dude out the way. I was like, I was in the sink, like, ah, yo, the fuck wrong with me, yo. So I drank a whole bunch of milk, start rolling around on the ground. Like this shit was crazy. It was so embarrassing for me later. So they called the ambulance, the ambulance like strapped me to the seat. You know what I'm saying? I was like, yo. It was like, I could hear the dude like, yo, his heart is really beating. I was like, yo. <laughs> they had me strapped down. I went to the hospital. It was LSD all in my system. That was a crazy experience because when I was in the hospital, I seen like little people and shit. Like, I never forget that shit. That shit was crazy. Like, and niggas was smoking. Around where I was from, niggas was smoking wet cigarettes. They were smoking leak. It was called leak. Niggas called smoking that bombing fluid. Like, they was dipping their cigarettes in angel, like, like, like in bombing fluid. They call it like wet. You know what I'm saying? They was smoking wet cigarettes, doing crazy shit. You know what I'm saying? So, I had that little experience right there. That was crazy for me right there. I just wanted to talk about that. But I was wilding on that. But then later on, after I got off that high, every time I smoke weed, it's like that experience made me like not smoke weed because every time I smoke weed, because the weed was in it, it had weed in it. The, Every time I smoke weed, it's like my body think it's on LSD. So I trip, I get paranoid on weed. I'm like, damn, that shit crazy. I try over and over trying to smoke weed. I just can't, nigga. It just takes me back to that trauma. So um, I start wilding out in the street with people. Like, you know what I'm saying? Just smoking cigarettes, drinking alcohol, like staying out on type of nights, doing whatever. Like back then we had a whole culture of just crime. Like crime pays. Like it was all about crime. It was all about fighting. We was fighting a lot, you know what I'm saying? Shaved the head off, everybody wanted to be DMX, Mob Deep, you feel me? Like, I grew up, like, trying to be, you know, grimy, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I started, like, doing, like, stupid shit, like, robbery, like, I had a, at a young age, I had a rap sheet for doing, like, a lot of crimes, you feel me? So they sent me to, like, a residential home, and in that, re like, what it was called, in Violent, New Jersey, they sent me to Violent, New Jersey, I went to this little institution for boys and girls, and from there I went to Jamesburg. 
And from there I went to Jamesburg. Jamesburg was a prison for boys. And in Jamesburg, it was a lot of fighting. You feel me what I'm saying? Like I, and, and I think I died one time in there. <laughs> I got jumped by 20 Latin King niggas. You feel what I'm saying? Like, and then at 16 years old, I got sent to um, maximum security. You feel me? Like up north. And, and that's where everything got serious for me. That's where I learned how to play chess. That's where I, I start reading and looking at uh, religious books. You know, from where I come from, you know, I was 23 hour lockdown in a cell, you know, 23 hour lockdown, five years. Statistically, I was supposed to get out and go right back in. Proud of myself. Overcame that, dog. I was born without a mother and a father. To my existence, I was put in foster care. Everything I overcame. While I was in Babylon, I succeeded in Babylon. I became a leader in my community. Mastered it. Mastered it. I got money. I, I did it the way I did it. I hustled. The idea of going to work for somebody never appealed to me. So no matter how I got my money, I did it. I didn't hurt nobody. I didn't sell. Well, I might have sold a couple drugs. Might have. I was like the plug guy sometimes. Sometimes I knew somebody that knew somebody and I could direct you, but I was never someone selling no drugs. Drugs might have sell some bags of weed or some shit like that and some shit like that, but it was only for partying and shit like that, but it was never no big drug dealer or nothing like that. Come to think about it, I never was a gangster. I just went through that lifestyle. That's the life that I was dealt in and that was the culture. And so I was playing along with it, but I never was no killer. I never was no gangster. I was around killers and I was around gangsters. I know who, what that, what that reflection of myself looks like. That's not who I am. I was observing that. I was around it. I'm a fighter, but I'm not a gangster is a difference. I'm